This has been a year like no other I can remember. I feel no need to say more about all that's happened in the months lying behind us now. Not least because on this day of all days, Christmas Day, I have no wish to look backwards into the dark. This is a message about looking forwards and into the light. Light in the darkness has been a quest and a hope for humankind for hundreds of thousands of years. The oldest hearth we know about, the oldest fire deliberately kindled and tended by our ancestors, was in Kesem Cave in Israel, which is in the Holy Land, which is in that part of the world they used to call the Levant, which means to rise, as in the place where the sun rises. In the heart of Kesem Cave, archaeologists found a thick bed of ash, testament to countless fires accumulated over countless thousands of years. There were fragments of burnt bone among the ash, so that the fires had also been for cooking. The first of the fires there may have been lit more than 300,000 years ago. It is almost impossible to know who lived and died by the light of those fires. Human remains in the form of a handful of teeth suggest ancestors combining characteristics of Neanderthals and also of us, Homo sapiens, modern human beings. After the first fire was kindled, those ancestors kept coming back to Kesem Cave over and over again, off and on for perhaps as long as 200,000 years. So many fires, so many lights lit in defiance of the dark. Hearth and home, family and food to share. I very much like the fact that the first home fires we know about were in that holy land where lies Bethlehem in the Levant, where the sun rises, that place where so much began, so much that shaped the world in which we live. Closer to home, near Stonehenge, that most famous of British Stone Age monuments, farmers gathered more than 4,000 years ago at the time of the winter solstice, the longest night, to share food cooked on great fires. It was the heart of winter when all seems bleakest, coldest and darkest, when the sun and perhaps hope were furthest from them. And so maybe they were in the habit of coming together in their thousands to sit around fires and to share one another's company and perhaps to reassure each other that the worst was behind them, that the sun, light and warmth would soon return to them. They brought with them the ashes of their dead, of the loved bodies of those that had died during the year. They brought them to Stonehenge and buried them by the stones. The main axis of Stonehenge points to where the sun rises in midsummer and where it sets in midwinter. It seems it was altogether a place where people gathered to mark the comings and goings of the sun. As well as fire, our ancestors loved the sun that other source of light and warmth, for the longest time, surely since the beginning. The Romans worshipped the sun, which they knew and understood as the god they called Sol. According to the Roman calendar, the 25th of December was the winter solstice, the shortest day. After the solstice, the days grew longer as the sun returned to the world from the wastes of winter. By the time of the late Roman Empire, in the 300s AD, there was the worship of Sol Invictus, which is Latin and means the unconquered sun, and the festival in his name was on the 25th of December. The unconquered sun. I like that. The first Christians, in the first centuries after Jesus was born, had no interest in knowing the date of his birth. In the New Testament, Paul and Mark make no mention of it, while the Gospels of Matthew and Luke describe the Nativity, neither says when it happened. Only later did Christians decide Jesus had been born on the 25th of December, and it's possible the date was borrowed from the Roman cult of Sol Invictus. No one knows for sure. Virgil was a Roman poet who lived in the century before Jesus was born. Among much else, he wrote a set of poems called the Bucolics, a word meaning shepherds. One of the poems is quite different from all the rest, all about a boy child 
whose coming signals the start of a golden age, a boy who shall free the earth from never-ending fear and reign over a world at peace. Virgil died 20 years or more before the birth of Jesus and yet seemed to have felt from beyond the horizon of time the warmth of a sun not yet risen, a sun not yet born. It has been said by another that only four things escape the changes wrought by time, that they are sunlight, gold, amber and honey. To that list I would add hope. Fires lit in defiance of the dark, a sun rising in the sky, a sun rising to save the world. Whether you're religious or not, Christian or not, these are good thoughts encouraging and hopeful thoughts in times such as those through which we are living now. It can be hard to know where to look for signs of hope. Every day I receive letters from people in need of hope. They write about disputes with family and friends, about losing their jobs on account of having chosen not to take any of the vaccines. They write from all over the world about how they cannot make sense of decisions taken by their governments about feeling they must have lost their minds, or that at the very least, they no longer understand the world. They write about feeling completely alone and also desperate. More and more, they write about feeling caught in a battle between good and evil, about feeling enveloped by darkness and of their need for a light to guide them. Too many write about having lost all hope and how they are finding it harder and harder, all but impossible to keep going. Many of the letters break my heart, but I read and also cherish every single one of them. I have kept them all, safely in a basket and all together, together with hundreds of others that say the same. Each letter is proof of a life, and every life matters. Every life, when first kindled into being, is a light in the dark. This message is very much for those in need of hope and struggling to find it anywhere else. I believe hope is always close by, sometimes out of sight and seemingly out of reach, but hope is always there, whether or not we can see it, like the sun behind clouds. There's a story about a few words found scratched into a wall in a basement where people had been hiding, evading capture during World War II. There's every chance the story is only apocryphal, but we have the words just the same. However and whenever they were conjured into being, kindled like a light in the darkness, those words are important and worth remembering for all time. I believe in the sun even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I cannot feel it. I believe in God even when he is silent. I think that's a perfect and important idea. It's about remembering and knowing even in the darkest, coldest, and seemingly loveless and hopeless of times, that somewhere the sun is still shining, that we are loved and that we are not alone. I believe that. Better yet, I know that. I think there are stories that matter whether they are true or not. I think some stories last and are remembered for thousands of years because whether or not the events described therein actually happened, they contain hope, and hope is among the most important things to have perhaps the most important. The Christian Christmas story matters because it has given people hope for 2,000 years. It might be the best story of all. Last year, the government said they were cancelling Christmas. Can you even believe it? Or at least they tried to. Cancel Christmas, like telling the tide not to rise or planet Earth not to turn around the sun. Nonetheless, unknown numbers of people were left alone, cut off from those they loved. This year, politicians kept the sword of Damocles, a sword of doubt and uncertainty, hanging over Christmas until the last minute, threatening to disrupt people's lives, to keep families apart, to keep people isolated and alone, out of reach of those they love and need, to take away hope has been central to the way governments around the world have sought to seize and then to exercise power to which they are not entitled. Frightened people, people without hope are easy to control and governments like to control people. 
Christmas is nothing to do with politicians. Our families are nothing to do with politicians. Hope is nothing to do with politicians. Christmas and family and hope are our business and our business alone. Christmas is something of the heart. Family is more important than the pompous, self-important pronouncements of any politician. I'm with my family this Christmas because that's where I belong and that's where I choose to be. I hope you are with those you love too. And if you are alone, you are loved just the same. I said at the beginning that this is intended as a message of hope. The longest night is behind us now, and that is a fact. Light and warmth are returning because they must return, just as the grass must grow. Light and warmth and hope always return, just as the sun always rises. On this day of all days, Christmas Day, the sun is here.